It is a pleasure to welcome you today to the George Oss Memorial Lecture of 2012. I am Gracia Grindall, Chair of the Oss Lecture Series Committee. For those who didn't know him, George Oss was a professor at Luther Seminary for many years. He was a small, short man and had to stand on an apple crate to see over the pulpit. But to his students and colleagues, he was a man of great stature who had impact on the church in his time and even today through these lectures. The Oss Lectureship was established some 30 years ago in order that his voice and particular emphasis on living Christianity and the fundamental importance of evangelism for living congregations, that it would endure here at Luther and spread out to the world. Over the years, the Oss Lecture Committee has invited people from almost every stripe in the ecumenical church to help us think about how we in the church and here at the seminary should obey Christ's great commission to go into the, all the world and make disciples. Today we are pleased to have with us Dr. Tom Long, Bandy Professor of Preaching at Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Graduate of Erskine College, Tom received his PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. Almost from the first, Tom has been in love with preaching and the teaching of preaching. Today he is ranked among the very best of preachers in America. He loves it, as you saw this morning, and one of his great talents is not only to be a good preacher, but to be able to teach preachers. He has thought deeply about how one should preach the gospel and teach preachers in a time when things are very different from what they were even 20 years ago. His many books and articles show him to be a man with a restless curiosity about these questions. How can we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ today? Who is our audience? What do people need to hear so they will be moved by the gospel? All questions those of us in the business need to ponder deeply with him. We are grateful this afternoon that Dr. Long has come to us to help us think about the craft of preaching, a craft so hard to learn, but an urgent calling for the church today. And so we are eager to hear his lecture and welcome him as he speaks on reading other people's mail, preaching the New Testament epistles as gospel for a disenchanted age. Tom. Well, it's, it's a thrill to be here this afternoon. I was able to say at lunch to the Oss family how honored I am to be a part of this very distinguished series and uh, to lift up the memory of one who did see in every way that the church continued to tell the old, old story of the gospel. Uh, it's also um, something of a homecoming for me to be here. I've been here a number of times and uh, have great friends on this faculty and in this town. Um, you know, I have been in love with preaching since the beginning of my ministry, and it was a Lutheran who taught me to love preaching. And when I was in seminary, the way I put myself and family through uh, school was I was a disc jockey on WABV radio, uh, which was located in a cow pasture in Abbeville, South Carolina. And uh, because I was the young kid on the staff, I drew all the uh, bad shifts, the ones that people didn't want, and one of those was Sunday morning. And they say that in the South, on AM radio, the farther to the right you are on the dial, the kookier Sunday morning is. Uh, we were 1590, and, <laughs> and we had one Appalachian wind-sucking preacher after another that we broadcast on Sunday morning until we got to the Protestant hour and especially the Lutheran series uh, featured a preacher named Edmund Stimley who taught preaching at Union Seminary in New York. And he had taken the Law Gospel Convention, uh, which uh, runs through a lot of Lutheran preaching and had put it in contemporary dress. Instead of old law and gospel, it had become uh, Stimley's, in the first half of the sermon, Stimley's existential anguish with the gospel. And for the first 10 minutes, you thought he was an agnostic. 
And then he would take a turn and he would end up the sermon just barely hanging on to the faith by his fingernails. And I never heard anything like it. So exciting and fresh and pertinent. And I fell in love with homiletics wearing earphones in a radio station in Abbeville, South Carolina, listening to a Lutheran preacher, and I am eternally grateful for it. In his wonderful book about biblical preaching, uh, What's Good About This News, David Bartlett tells the story of the day he became a lectionary preacher. He was a brand new parish minister, and he said that he was in love with Pauline theology and Galatians was the home of his heart. He preached Galatians every Sunday that he could. He preached the great themes in Galatians, the freedom of the gospel in Christ, the righteousness of God, and so on. And one Sunday, after he had preached a stemwinder sermon out of Galatians, he was standing at the door shaking hands with his congregation and a member of his congregation came out who happened to be none other than the great ethicist, James Gustafson. And Gustafson said, well, son, there is no question where the center of the canon lies with you. But we need some balance. We need a little Matthew to balance your Paul. We need a little Wesley to balance your Luther. And then stalked out into the Sunday sunshine. Bruised by this, um, David Bartlett went back to his study and took his Bible off of his desk and opened it up intending to find a text for next Sunday, not in Galatians. And when he opened the Bible, seven pages that had broken loose from the binding fluttered to the floor. He reached over to pick them up, the book of Galatians. <laughs> Worn out from overuse, it was that day, he said, he became a lectionary preacher. Now that was then and now is now. There was a time in the church when the preaching of the Pauline epistles was something that many preachers, especially of a strong theological stripe, majored in. It may be that you are still one of those preachers. If you are, you are a marked exception to the rule. One of the astonishing things about preaching in the Christian church today is how two portions of the canon have been silenced. The Old Testament is rarely heard in Christian preaching. And interestingly enough, the epistolary material is rarely heard in preaching today as well. I think there are three main reasons why this has happened, and one of them, ironically, is the rise of the lectionary, especially among the lower Protestant traditions. We have all become what many of you have always been, and that is lectionary preachers. And the resources are there to back it up in profound ways today, but the architecture of the lectionary, especially during the seasons of the Christian year, inevitably tilts one toward the gospel. And most of the lectionary-based resources tend to underscore uh, preaching on the gospel to the neglect of the other aspects of the canon, especially epistolary literature. But that's not the only reason, not just the lectionary. There is no longer the theological nest out there to put the eggs that we find in epistles uh, into the congregational transaction. Or to put it another way, there is a kind of theological amnesia in the church that makes the traditional preaching of the epistolary literature like dropping marbles onto a tile floor. There is nothing out there to receive it. I was talking recently to the head of one of the major charitable foundations in America, and he said that several years ago <clears throat> there was a meeting of the presidents and directors and chairs of many of the great charities in America, United Way, American Red Cross, and so on. The theme of the meeting was, why is it that such a large segment of American charitable giving is done in the name of religion? And in order to understand this, they brought in a systematic theologian to help them explain this phenomenon. And he talked to them about eschatology and sacrifice and so on and this man said you cannot believe how badly the conversation went 
because those big theological words intended to embrace a comprehensive range of reality were translated by virtually everyone in the room in terms of interior states of personal piety. He finally concluded, I have decided that every educated person in the United States lacks the capacity to speak of transcendence. Andrew Del Bacco said something of the same thing in his book in the late 80s, The Disappearance of Satan. He remarked that in 1912, when the Titanic went down, the whole culture talked about it theologically. Pride goes before a fall and so on. But when the Challenger exploded, just before Del Bacco wrote his book, the culture was mute theologically. About the deepest explanation we could come up with was, Maybe this means that the Russians are ahead. Harry Emerson Fosdick in the 1920s scorned Protestant preaching as being overly minutiae in terms of biblical material, and he said only the preacher comes to the sanctuary desperately anxious to learn what happened to the Jebusites. Well, we might rephrase it today that only the preacher comes to the sanctuary interested in the relationship between justification and sanctification. You can't get a conversation going on Christology. The nest is not out there. The third reason I think we have had a diminishment of epistolary preaching is because we have had a commensurate rise in interest in narrative preaching. For the past 50 or 60 years in America, the method of choice for most preachers has been some form of narrative preaching. Uh, David Reynolds at Northwestern University has written a fascinating article to say, narrative preaching comes and goes in the American preaching uh, idiom, and this is actually the third time in American history that narrative has become the method of choice. It happened around the Second Great Awakening, especially under the influence of slave preachers and Methodist itinerants. It happened in the Industrial Revolution when preachers like Henry Ward Beecher in Brooklyn looked out at displaced Midwesterners who had moved into the Industrial Northeast and practically invented the modern sermon illustration. And it happened in our own time. But we are watching a genre shift in American preaching. I do not want to, I am a narrative preacher and I do not want to lose what we have learned, but I am watching our American pulpit change its style away from narrative as the predominant form of preaching. What is coming into four? Well, at first glance, under the mega churches and the independent churches and the television and radio preachers, you might say that what is coming into the fore is a resurrection of the didactic form of the American sermon. The teaching sermon is coming back. And as a matter of fact, in many of these churches, they don't talk about the preaching, they talk about the teaching. And for the first time in 200 years, the average American sermon is getting longer rather than shorter under the influence of this particular style. However, I think if you put the microscope on it, it's not exactly the old teaching style that is coming back into four. It's something like an Aristotelian would call phronesis preaching. That is to say, practical wisdom on the ground. How do we live our lives? How should we relate to each other? How should we manage our time? How can we keep our relationships sane and uh, healthy? This is the kind of preaching that we're seeing. Several years ago, Don Browning in Pastoral Theology wrote a book called The Moral Context of Pastoral Care. And in that book he said, pastors of my generation were trained that when somebody comes to us for pastoral counseling, what it meant was that they were unable to cope with the moral fray on the outside. And they were coming to us and saying, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I can't do it. And what we were supposed to do is to say, in effect, all right, I understand. 
And I want you to know that in the safety of this relationship, there is no right and there is no wrong. There is simply acceptance and grace. And in the context of acceptance and grace, the idea was people could put their lives back together and get back out into the moral fray. That was fine, said Browning, as long as people were actually coming and saying, I know what I'm supposed to do, I just can't do it. But now, he said, many are coming to us and saying, in effect, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. The moral fray is not clear. And in that context, to suspend the moral categories is to exacerbate the problem. And Browning called on pastoral caregivers to call not simply on the grace tradition in Scripture, but on the wisdom and moral inquiry traditions in Scripture. And in a sense, I want to make the same sort of argument about a renewed sense of preaching from the epistles. I don't want to lose the narrative sensibilities that we have learned over the last 50 years, but I want to supplement them with another vocabulary that is perhaps more matched to the cultural moment that we are finding in our churches and beyond. Walter Brueggemann wrote a book a number of years ago called The Bible Makes Sense. And in that book, which was written for Christian educators really, he drew a target. There was a bullseye and then two rings. In the bullseye, he said, are the central texts of scripture. And in there, he put what he called primal narratives, Exodus and Easter. These are the formative acts of God recorded in Scripture that function as the center, said Brueggemann, of the canon. The next ring out he called secondary narratives. Secondary narratives, those are narratives that are derived from the primal narratives. Who is this who was raised from the dead on Easter? Well, Jesus, he taught in parables, and he healed the sick, and he cast out demons. These are narratives that explain, that relate to the primal narratives. But there's one more layer out. He called it the literature of institutionalization and mature theological reflection. And a lot of the epistolary literature falls in that outer ring. But that outer ring is very much related to the two rings on the inside of it. The mature theological reflection and institutionalization literature depends upon the narratives, the primary and secondary narratives. So I'm suggesting uh, to my students these days that we need to learn how to preach more like the Gospel of Matthew than the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke is story, 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 story. Matthew is story ethics, story teaching, story ethics. There is this rhythm back and forth. And in terms of the reflection on the phronesis, the practical, on the ground, lived out reality of the Christian faith, the epistolary literature provides a kind of resource for preaching that I think can become revitalized again. This means becoming aware of and interested in the on-the-ground messy practices that are a part of congregational life inevitably and were a part of the New Testament churches themselves and looking at them not as pure vessels for theological ideas, but compromised realities in which the gospel was lived out in messy and tangled kinds of ways. That relates to the way people experience the Christian life today. Luke Johnson, a colleague of mine in New Testament at Emory, wrote an interesting book called Religious Experience in the New Testament. And he opened it with a fascinating example. He's Roman Catholic, Luke Johnson is. And he said, in every Roman Catholic church I know about, there is a front of the church and a back of the church. At the front of the church are the symbols of the magisterium, the altar, the pulpit, the missal, the priesthood, 
At the back of the church, there is a bulletin board with news clippings of sightings of the Virgin Mary. Novenas are being made to St. Jude. Notices of pilgrimages here and there and charismatic prayer meetings being held in people's homes. He said the New Testament has always been studied from the front of the church. I would like to study it from the back of the church. What were the actual religious experiences and practices that held together these fragile Christian communities as they were learning how to live out the gospel? Uh, the great uh, historian Eamon Duffy wrote a kind of major work called The Stripping of the Altars, and in the research for that work, he ran into some resource material from the little English town of Morabath, at the eve of the English Reformation, <clears throat> Morabath had one parish church. It had had the same pastor for 50 years, the same priest, and he happened to be a priest who kept a diary and wrote down every day what was going on in the little village and in the parish of Morabath. It's a treasure trove for historians. And so Eamon Duffy wrote a second book uh, about Morabath, what was going on at the eve of the Reformation in Morabath? Well, the congregation was helping him raise money to buy a new set of black vestments. Some teenagers in the congregation were making beeswax candles for the liturgy. A number of men in the congregation were raising sheep and sh uh, selling the wool to supplement the parish budget. The congregation was divided into committees and each committee was assigned a statue and they were to keep that statue polished and clean and once a year every committee statue got to be moved front and center in the liturgy. Then overnight the little parish in Morabath by law moved from Roman Catholic to Anglican, from Catholic to Protestant. What happened? Out went the black vestments. Away went the beeswax candles. No longer were people expected to support the budget in the way that they had. All the statues were banished from the liturgy. There were no more ale days, uh, the version of uh, potluck suppers uh, in the community of Morabath. All of it was gone. And church life in Morabath collapsed because there was no form to it. The Reformation had come to them as a series of ideas without practices. And when the practices were gone, uh, gone too was the texture of church life. Will Williman and Stanley Harawas, as you probably know, a number of years ago, wrote a controversial book called Resident Aliens, in which they built on Alistair McIntyre's understanding of practice to argue for the Christian life as an embodied set of practices. Recently in the Christian century, Will Williman repented of what he had done in that book and said that nowadays practices are being talked about in godless ways. They are simply a form of works righteousness. Uh, James K.A. Smith, a philosopher at Calvin College, in a blog on the Duke Divinity School website, responded to Williman's recantation by saying, from my corner of North American Christianity, a Chalcedonian appreciation of how God grabs hold of us in embodied practice is a crucial correction to the functional Gnosticism that pervades evangelicalism. Christian practices, said Smith, are the charged places, the hot spots of God's sacramental presence and the Spirit's sanctifying power. This is how the Spirit gets hold of us embodied material creatures. God's presence in the practices is an extension of the logic of the incarnation. Well, I'd like to suggest that that's truer than Willimon's rejection of his own earlier thought, that the early Willimon was closer to being right than the later one. And that as a matter of fact, what we need to do is to attend in our preaching to the formlessness of Christian life, to the lack of 
of serious practicing that goes on in congregations and to help people look at on the ground ways that the Christian faith is lived out. Uh, Leon Wieselte is the literary editor of the New Republic and a secular Jew. When his father died, for reasons not clear even to himself, he decided to pick up the ancient practice of saying the mourner's Kaddish. What it involves is the oldest child of a deceased Jew goes every day to the synagogue for a year and stands there wrapped in the leather bands of the tepelin with a portion of the Torah attached, actually praying from the Torah and prays the mourner's Kaddish, which is not a sentimental or emotional uh, uh, psalmic prayer at all. It's utterly praise, utterly praise. So Wieselte decided to do this. He travels a lot, and so some mornings at 6.30, he would be at a synagogue in a foreign city, a distant city, and he would wrap himself in these bands and say the mourner's cottage. One morning in Cincinnati, he was wrapping himself in the leather bands, getting ready to say the mourner's cottage, and there was a shift in him. He said, I have discovered that these no longer bind me, they gird me. And I would like to suggest that a certain kind of preaching aimed at the formative nature of the practices of the Christian life on the ground might move from binding people to girding them. So let's preach on the epistles, not as abstract doctrinal essays about grace and freedom and so on, but about sermons and letters addressed to fragile Christian communities in volatile and pluralistically political, cultural, and faith contexts. In other words, exactly the kind of congregations that we're looking at. Somebody was trying to help them, Paul or whoever. Somebody was trying to help them have a formative nature of the Christian life. My wife and I have a summer home on the Chesapeake Bay. We are in the poorest county in Maryland, but one of the most beautiful. We're right on the water. Most of the, our neighbors are what they call watermen. These are commercial crabbers and oyster people. And the watermen now have a battle going with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. The Department of Natural Resources knows why the Chesapeake Bay is dying fertilizer running off of farms is going into the water of the bay and leaching out the oxygen and killing the seafood. And so the Department of Natural Resources has new rules for the watermen. They can only catch a certain number of crabs or oysters and they can only fish a certain number of days. The watermen are almost all Methodist and they do not agree with the Department of Natural Resources. They have been doing this for generations. And sometimes the crab harvest is good and sometimes it's not good and the way they describe it is the Lord gives crabs and the Lord takes away crabs. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> now we have a classic collision here between what might be called uh, in Charles Taylor's terms the disenchanted world and the enchanted world. The Department of Natural Resources lives in a disenchanted world. It's fertilizer leaching the oxygen out of the water that takes the crabs away. The watermen live in an enchanted world. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What I would hope for my people when I preach is that we would become bilingual. We would have the capacity to recognize the truthfulness of scientific inquiry into the loss of seafood in the Chesapeake Bay without losing the theological pregnancy of all of life's situations so that we can speak of them in both ways. I think this is what is happening in a lot of the epistolary literature and I would like to use it for my own preaching resource. Okay, how are we gonna do this? Well, first of all, I think a responsible preacher on the epistolary literature does not take it simply as a vanilla milkshake of biblical texts, but recognizes that we're dealing with a particular literary genre. Uh, 
Biblical letters come in a particular form or shape, and we need to know our way around the architecture. For example, the ancient Hellenistic letter starts with the signature. It starts with the signature. We sign our letters today at the end of the letter. They sign theirs at the beginning of the letter. But you can tell a lot about a letter by the way that it is signed. I sometimes sign my letters, Love Tom. If you ever see one of those, you kind of know what the letter is. If one of my students wants to do PhD work at Yale and wants me to write a letter of recommendation, I rarely sign those, Love Tom. <laughs> I sign them, Thomas G. Long, Mandy Professor of Preaching, Emory University, Atlanta, Georgia. I pull out all the stops. Well, when we're preaching on a letter, we ought to look at the way it's signed. It could be signed like Philippians, Paul and Timothy, slaves of Jesus Christ. You already know what kind of letter you're dealing with. Or it could be like Galatians. Paul, an apostle, not by human authority, but by the will of God. I mean, he's already into it. <laughs> or listen to the way that he signs his signature in Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel according to his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including you. That's on his business card, it's a, it's a fairly uh, long uh, title. But as Catherine Grebe has noted in her commentary on the story of Romans, all of a sudden, even in the signature, we recognize that Paul has connected his identity to the total narrative of God's action in the world. His identity has been absorbed into the larger narrative identity of what God is doing. I was reminded of Oliver Sacks, who was doing some of his neurological study, and he found an interesting case in a nursing home of an, a sailor who had been hospitalized in the home because he had lost all of his long-term memory. He has a particular neurological disorder in which he could no longer remember where he was from, his parents, his background, what he had done vocationally, all of it was gone. And so Sachs said to the nuns who ran this particular facility, do you think that he has lost his soul? To which the nuns became angry and said, no, watch him in chapel. And so Sachs went to chapel and saw him absorbed into the movement of the great story being told by the liturgy. He was being given an identity he could not manufacture or remember for himself. Now, I think there's something to preach about our identity being larger than the ways that the culture wants to define our identity and it being connected to the actual articulation of the story in the liturgy of, of the church. That's an on-the-ground, practical way of understanding identity formation. My wife was the pastor of a small church in New Jersey, and there was a couple in the congregation having marital problems. I'm not talking out of school, it was a small town, everybody knew. As a matter of fact, he stopped coming to church. She would come by herself and cry through the hymns. Now one of the things that my wife insisted on in the liturgy of this little Presbyterian church is that we have the passing of the peace. The congregation did not like it, but my wife thought it was wise, and so she enforced it on the congregation. At a point in the liturgy, we had to turn to each other, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. One Sunday, I was sitting on the back pew, and she was sitting in front of me, crying through the opening hymn. He had moved out. It looked like things were over. 
About halfway through the service, I heard a gasp. It was one of the ushers. I turned around, and there he was. He came and stood at the end of his wife's pew. She looked startled, alarmed, and slid as far as she could down to the other end. He sat down on this end. And then we got to the passing of the peace. We all stood up. He walked over to her and said, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. She hesitated. And then she extended her hands and also with you. She sat down next to him. He put his hand on her knee. And after the benediction, they went home and worked it out. They were given a piece. They were given a narrative which they could not conjure up for themselves. And their own personal identities got absorbed into the larger story of the gospel. Now, the next thing that happens, or one of the next things that happens in the architecture of a letter is what uh, is called philophrenesis. We still have it in our letters today. We call it fluff. <laughs> and it goes like this. Dear Janice, I remember with great joy the wonderful time our families had together at Myrtle Beach last summer. Oh, to see the children frolicking in the waves, the wonderful seafood dinners that we had, the great time sitting out on the porch swapping stories, how marvelous it was. However, you never paid for your part of the rent. And <laughs> Okay, before you get down to business in the letter, there's a little making nice, making nice. It's called philophrenesis, fluff. The thing about Paul is that he actually changes the philophrenesis usually into Eucharistic prayer. Before I get down to business, I want to thank God, he says. For example, in Corinthians, you remember the background on Corinthians. Paul had been their pastor. They had run into problems. They had written Paul. Paul was now responding to the problems. What were the problems? Well, they hated each other's guts, for one thing. They were divided into personality cliques, biting at each other viciously. Not only that, they were fighting over the Lord's Supper. They were fighting over baptism. They had worship wars. There was uh, early Gnosticism arising in the congregation. They were fighting over speaking in tongues, and most of them did not believe in the resurrection. Other than that, they were doing great. <laughs> Listen to the philophrenesis in Corinthians. Before I get to your problems, let us pray. I give thanks to my God always for you. <laughs> because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. In every way you've been enriched in him, in speech, yeah, <laughs> speaking in tongues, ripping them apart. Gnosis of every kind, yeah. <laughs> Just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, right? You don't believe in the resurrection. You're not lacking in any spiritual gift. Yeah, spiritual gifts are burning the church down. <laughs> he strengthens you to the end that you may be blameless. Blameless, they're sexually immoral. God is faithful by him you are called into the fellowship of his son. In other words, the prayer list is the problem list because it's in the broken places that the grace of God is gonna shine through. Now that's on the ground, church life. It's not the abstraction of the grace of God, it's the grace of God working itself out in the worship wars and personal conflicts and issues going on in a real congregation's life. I'm going to skip over the body, I'll get back to that in a minute, but we end up with the closing of letters, and this is the part we usually throw away. This is, you know, I'll see you in winter, send my coat and my books, tell Timothy I love him, you know, that kind of thing that comes at the end of the letters. But as a matter of fact, these are not throwaway items. These are real parts of congregational practice and life. For example, this line in Philippians 4, the close of Philippians, Philippians. 
Therefore, my brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. You, Odea, Syntyche, get together in the Lord. Be of the same mind. Yes, and I ask you all, my loyal companions, help these women. They've struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, we have a very embarrassing moment here because Philippians is not being read between leather covers or it's not posted on a cork board out in the narthex of the church. It's being read out loud in worship. And suddenly, abruptly, at the end of this friendship letter, Paul names the names of two women. Euodia, Syntyche, knock it off. Get together. One commentator says somewhat anachronistically, at that point, two women sank a little lower in the pew. We don't know the problem. Probably Euodia liked praise music and Syntyche liked traditional hymns. But there was some conflict. Now, why does he call them down out loud by name in worship? I'm calling on all of my co-workers, help these women. For your names are written in the book of life. That's probably a baptismal reference. And it's a reminder that this is not the only time that Euodia and Syntyche have had their names called out in church. Euodia, Syntyche, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He's not calling them down. He's calling them up to their baptismal identities, reminding them of the covenant that exists among the baptized community. Down in the marrow of a church life, theology actually lived on the ground. By the way, I commend to you an article by Peter Lumpe. It's included in a book called The Romans Debate about the 16th chapter of Romans. All it is is a list of names. Greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so, they worked with me in the Lord. Greet so-and-so in so-and-so's house. And don't forget to say hello to so-and-so. And Lampe looks at that list of names like a kindergarten teacher would look at her fall roll before the students show up, trying to analyze who am I going to have in my class in terms of race, gender, class, and all the other things that you can often tell by names. There are 26 names there, said Lampe, nine women and 17 men. However, several of these names are singled out for, for praise because of their special labors in the gospel seven women and five men. In two places, some of the names are called by Paul, my relatives, which means Jews. Men and women, Jew and Gentile. 14 of the names are not common to Rome, says Lampe. They're immigrants, immigrant and native. You can't tell for all the names, but for those that you can tell, two-thirds of them are of slave origins. We know from other sources that some of the members of the Roman congregation sold themselves into slavery and uh, donated the proceeds to the widows and the orphans. What a remarkable glimpse of an early Christian community, men and women laboring together in the gospel, special responsibility laid upon women, immigrant and native, Jew and Gentile, brought together in communion by Jesus Christ. Don't throw away Romans 16. You can see on the ground the theology of the gospel being lived out. Finally, when we get to the body of the letter, there are certain ideas that should not be abstracted from congregational life but are best preached as on-the-ground realities. For example, this famous passage in Philippians 2. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord in one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. 
Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality. Why am I singing? Because we think that Paul is not composing here. He's quoting an ancient Christian hymn. And traditional historical critical commentaries will note that and then go immediately to what is of interest to them. Is this a Persian dying rising God myth that has been brought into the Christian faith? What is the meaning of kenosis? And uh, it's very important, of course. But what gets washed out is, what does it mean when your pastor writes you a letter and quotes one of your favorite hymns? What does that do? It takes you right into worship takes you into the sanctuary as it were have this mind among you the mind that you have when you're caught up in the ecstasy of worship at that point the business of vaunting your own ambition gets sublimated to the larger ecstasy of prayer and song David Ford the British theologian said the interesting thing about singing in worship It's one of the few activities that people participate in life in which it is non-competitive space. There is always room for another voice. Keep adding voice upon voice. There's also an ethic about worship. I hate the hymn, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the road. It's just like fingernails being scratched on a, a blackboard to me. I can't stand that hymn. But if Sunday morning I open the bulletin and it's in there, have this mind among you. I'm to sing it with all the gusto I can muster because Ms. Williams on the pew next to me, that's the profoundest expression of her Christian faith. Now she's going to have to sing the church's one foundation for me. (laughs) But we belong to each other and it's manifest in the life uh, of worship. Or finally, 1 Corinthians 15. I used to think this was an abstract proof of the resurrection. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received and in which you stand, through which you are also being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. How, if Christ is proclaimed from the, as raised from the dead, can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith is in vain. We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he didn't raise if it's true that Christ has not been raised. Your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Those, uh, then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we've hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be perished. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. I used to think that was a kind of syllogism. And if I could understand it, You know, a syllogism, uh, you start with the truth, and then if that truth is true, then this is true, and if that's true, then this is true, and you arrive at the conclusion based on the truthfulness of the beginning of the argument. I used to think that's what this was, a syllogism, and if I could get it to work, especially if I could get it to work in my preaching, I could prove the resurrection. But it's circular reasoning, it wouldn't work as a syllogism. And then I finally discovered it actually is the opposite of a syllogistic argument. It works in reverse. It's not, if this is true, then this is true, then this is true. It's, if this isn't true, and that isn't true, and this is not true, then this isn't true. To which the hearer is supposed to say, but this is true. And then it rolls backwards, like, If you had studied for the history exam, you would have known the material, son. And if you had known the material, you would have been able to answer the questions. And if you'd answered the questions, you'd have passed the history exam. But you didn't pass the history exam. So you couldn't answer the questions and you didn't know the material. And that means that you didn't study. If Christ, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then the preaching that we gave to you about the resurrection was a damn lie. 
And if the preaching was a lie, then your faith is in vain. The one thing they know at Corinth is their faith is not in vain. It's the abstraction of the resurrection they can't deal with, but things are rocking and rolling on Sunday morning at Corinth. Their faith, their manifestations of power on Sunday morning, their faith is not in vain. So if your faith is not in vain, then the sermons that evoked it must have been true. And if the sermons that evoked it were true, then the content of them, the resurrection of Christ, is true. And if Christ is raised, then there is a resurrection of the dead. Which means on Easter, instead of trying abstractly to argue of the plausibility of the resurrection, where the preacher might start is with the persuasiveness of the manifestations of power and faith that are going on in your congregation. Where does that come from? It comes from the power of the risen Christ. In our church, we've had an interesting thing happen. We've long had a ministry to homeless people. We're right downtown Atlanta. We have a ministry to homeless people. We have an overnight shelter. We have a food pantry. We have a clothing closet. We have a ministry to homeless people. But in the last 10 years, some of the homeless have started joining our church. They're there at the Eucharist now. And it's messed up our preaching. We can no longer say, it is our responsibility to take care of the homeless. We are the homeless. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. But there are still some who are what social workers call service resistant. They won't come inside the building. They don't like institutions. They're afraid of them. They prefer to be on the street. So some of our associate pastors have been taking their guitars out on the street and having worship on the sidewalk. And not long ago, one of our young associate pastors had finished a service on the sidewalk with her guitar, and she said at the conclusion to the homeless, few homeless people who were there, hey, I know you guys don't like to come in the building, but on Wednesday, it's called Ash Wednesday, we're going to have a little service in our chapel, and it's kind of neat. What happens is we take some ashes that we got from last Palm Sunday's palms and we've mixed it with oil and our minister is going to put a cross on somebody's forehead and then give them the oil and ashes and they're going to put the cross on the next person's forehead and we're going to pass it around and it's a sign that God loves us even when life is coming apart. Well, I don't know how she did it or what she said that changed things but not only did these few homeless people come, but they passed the word in Atlanta, and 60 homeless people showed up pushing their carts and carrying their rolls. And coincidentally, across the street where the state legislature was in session at the Capitol, that morning on Ash Wednesday, one of the legislators said, I understand that there is an Ash Wednesday service at the church across the street I'm going, if anyone would like to go with me. 40 legislators showed up. And in our little chapel that seats about 75, we had 60 homeless and 40 legislators and a bunch of members of the congregation all jammed in cheek and jowl. And those who watched carefully said that to watch the homeless putting crosses on the foreheads of the state legislators and the state legislators putting crosses on the foreheads of the homeless was a sign of the kingdom of God. But your faith is in vain. My faith is not in vain. And the preaching of the resurrection must have been true. And if the preaching of the resurrection was true, then Jesus Christ is raised. And if Jesus Christ is raised, there is a resurrection of the dead. Be able to preach the gospel down in the marrow of congregational life. That's the opportunity that the epistles now give us. I'm going to put my mind to it. And maybe you will as well. Thank you very much for listening.